gravity conjecture. Um, I've, I'd of course like to first thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Um, and uh, I even feel like I can pretend that I'm in Banff because there's about a foot of snow out here in Ithaca. <laughs> All right, so today I'll be telling you about this um, upcoming work with my collaborators, Ben Heidenreich, Liam McAllister, Jakob Moritz, and Tom Rugelius. Okay, so just to summarize what this talk is about in uh, two sentences, I'll first describe a framework for uh, reconstructing the Kähler moduli spaces of Calabiao threefolds using a topological invariant called Gopa Kumar Bafa invariance. And uh, then I'll use this reconstruction to verify the weak gravity conjecture in a large ensemble of geometries. So uh, that's the two sentence summary, but let me now give you a roadmap of where we're going. I'll first uh, remind you of the weak gravity conjecture, but specifically I'll translate it into a statement about geometry. Um, then as promised, I'll show you how to reconstruct the Kähler moduli space using Gopa Kumar Bafa invariance. And finally, I'll use this reconstruction to test the weak gravity conjecture. All right, so just to set notation, let me state the weak gravity conjecture. So consider a gravitational theory containing a U1 gauge field. Then in order to be a consistent theory of quantum gravity, the conjecture says that there should exist a particle whose charge to mass ratio is larger than or equal to the charge to mass ratio of an extremal black hole in that theory. Okay, so that's kind of the original weak gravity conjecture, but in this talk, I'm going to be focusing on a slightly stronger formulation of the conjecture, um, known as the tower weak gravity conjecture, which says that instead of just a single particle satisfying this bound, there should exist an infinite number of particles that satisfy this bound in each direction in charge space. So this is hard to check in general, but we can make progress testing this version of the conjecture in certain regions of the charge space using BPS states. So just to go into a bit more, more detail about that, um, let's look at this sort of cartoon example where we have two U1 gauge fields so that particles in the theory can have charges Q1 or Q2 under those different gauge fields. And here I'm going to be plotting the charge to mass ratio um, in each direction. So first of all, there's a region in this parameter space known as the black hole region where black holes can exist. So black holes that live on the interior of this region are sub-extremal black holes and black holes that live on the boundary on this uh, gray, gray border here are exactly extremal. Um, and of course, black holes can't exist anywhere outside this region because if they did, they would be super extremal. So that's the black hole region. But in this parameter space, we can also plot the BPS bound. Um, so the BPS bound just says that every particle in the theory has a lower bound on its mass coming from the BPS threshold. And the important point about this picture is that uh, they don't agree everywhere. So the BPS bound and the extremality bound don't agree everywhere, but there's this interesting region where they overlap. Um, and it's in that region that we can make progress testing the weak gravity conjecture um, because we know that if the conjecture is to be satisfied there, it has to be satisfied with BPS particles. So this is kind of gonna be a main character. And you can see that in the charge space, um, this overlapping region defines a cone. And I'm gonna give this cone a name because it's, like I said, going to be the main character in our talk today. Um, I'll call it K tilde, all right? Um, and the tower weak gravity conjecture implies that for every charge direction inside K tilde, there should exist an infinite number of holomorphic curves hosting single particle states with charges proportional to Q. So all I mean by this is that for every ray inside of this cone K tilde, there should be an infinite tower of BPS states. So that's what we're gonna, that's what we're gonna check. So the required ingredients for studying this are, first of all, we have to know what the single particle states are, i.e. what are the BPS states in the theory? And second of all, we have to um, know what this cone is. What is K tilde? So the bulk of this talk is going to be about obtaining these two ingredients in a particular setting. Um, oh, is there a question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, hi, Naomi. Uh, this is Alexander. 
just uh, for simple for clarification for me i mean like uh, you say along each ray but uh, i mean if it's really weak gravity then you know each ray it's going fun. going outside the lila region uh, then you have it, shouldn't you only have the states outside the lila region in in, in uh, outside of it in, in the white uh, on the white uh, upper right part so to speak outside the the, the lila or pink region uh, because it, i mean charge bigger than mars or charge bigger than uh, the charge of an extreme black hole. Mm, I'm not sure I understand the question. You're saying shouldn't there only be states in a particular region of charge? Space? No, no, no. W oh. What I mean is, shouldn't they? If you if you look at these rays you were talking about that are they're coming from the origin and they're filling out this, uh, they're crossing the pink region, right, uh -huh. uh, uh, to the upper right. Yes. But uh, no, the how are we gravity? Shouldn't you only should this not only contain or apply to states where uh, which are sitting in the white outside the no in this cone K tilde, but outside the red line. In the white uh, yeah, so so Just I've done something a little bit sneaky in this picture, which is that this cone I'm drawing here, I'm imagining that it's a cone in the charge space, whereas this is the charge to mass space. Yeah, this, exactly. This is why this is why I was confused. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry that that is a little confusing, right? So I'm just saying that. Um, Right, so, so the states that lie in this region are of course in the charge to mass space only going to lie on this pink line. Because okay. Of, yes, states. But in if you just look at the charge lattice, they'll fill out an entire cone. Oh, I see. So the cone is, then, then I'm supposed to read the axis just as charge uh, axis. Exactly, yeah. Yes. Okay, thank okay. you, then, then, then I'm fine. Okay, thank, thank you. you. That, that, that's an important point. So K tilde is a cone in the charge space, not the charge okay. mass space. Yeah, Yeah. this is uh, because of the overlay. This is why I was confused. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, That that's an important clarification. Anything else before I go on? All right, so um, we're gonna be focused on these two ingredients. Um, and we're going to uh, get our hands on them in a particular setting. So um, let's describe that setting, first of all. So consider M theory compactified on a Calabria threefold, and I'll call this threefold X. Um, this compactification gives rise to a five dimensional effective theory, which has the nice feature that the polynomial prepotential is exact. So the prepotential is written here. It's a, a, a cubic polynomial where these coefficients are the um, kappa i, j, k are the triple intersection numbers of the Calabiao, and the t sub i are the Kähler parameters. Um, now, what are the BPS states in this theory? Well, they're M2 brains wrapped on holomorphic curves. Um, and so it's these states that we're going to verify satisfy the weak gravity conjecture. All right, so again, the BPS states are M2 brains wrapped on holomorphic curves, um, and these saturate the BPS bound. So just to remind you, the BPS bound um, is this inequality here, and BPS states have masses which are precisely equal to Z, which is the central charge of the theory. Um, like I alluded to earlier, BPS states come in cones in the charge space, and roughly speaking, they're counted by Gopakumar-Vafa invariance. So let's look at, at an example of how this might play out. So here, um, I'm plotting for you uh, in purple, the cone in the charge space where BPS states might live. So the BPS cone, or the Mori cone, as I'll call it for the rest of this talk. Um, and at each site in this charge lattice, we can go ahead and count the number of BPS states, or rather, we can calculate the Gopakumar Vafa invariant um, at that charge site. So that might look something like this. Um, and in fact, these are not just made up numbers. Um, these Gopakumar Vafa invariants were calculated really for an explicit Calabio. And um, maybe you're wondering how, how did I come to, you know, plot these numbers on the screen? Um, well, there's a well-known algorithm um, for computing uh, Gopa Kumar Vafa invariance by Hosono, Clem, Thiessen, and Yao, but my friends here at Cornell have made significant computational progress in computing the genus zero Gopa Kumar Vafa invariance for Calabiao threefolds in the kreuzer skarka database. And so luckily for me, I can simply use the software CY tools um, to, to uh, come to know the Gopa Kumar Vafa invariance. But I'll just say that this is not um, a talk about computing Gopa Kumar Vafa invariance, although, you know, um, I'm sure there will be many of those. Uh, for the rest of this talk, we'll just take the Gopa Kumar Vafa invariance as um, given to us. Is there another question? 
and is there a hand? No, okay. Um, if, if so, please go ahead. But all right, so we'll take the Gopukumarvaf invariance as um, just given to us. Just and one sorry, now just one question. Oh, yeah. You're talking about the genus zero version, which is a combination of some various spins. Right. Yes. The refinement of the statement, or you're just talking about some combination of different spin states. No, I'm I'm really just talking about the genus zero uh, GV invariance, which is is why I made sure to include the qualifier that uh, the BPS states are roughly counted by the. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, all right. Um, so there's two um, features I want to point your eye to in this collection of GV invariants. Um, the first is that we have rays like this one, which I've shaded in purple, um, which uh, has a non-zero GV invariant along on every single site in this ray. So um, this kind of ray hosts an infinite tower of BPS states. So that's the first feature. The, the second kind of ray that you might have is something like this red one, which has only a finite number of states. So you can see along this ray over here, um, there's a six at charge site zero comma one, but forever after that, it's always just zero. So this ray hosts only a finite number of states. And verifying the tower weak gravity conjecture in this context amounts to verifying that all the rays with a finite number of states, like this one in red, lie outside of the cone K tilde. So that's what we want to check. Um, all right, so that's the, the BPS states. And now I'm going to turn to, um, to getting our hands on this cone K tilde. But before I do that, any questions or clarification so far? All right, great. So K tilde. Um, again, we want to find the cone where spherically symmetric BPS black holes can exist. And recently, Alim, Heidenreich, and Rudelius proved that this is contained in the cone K tilde, which I'll now define for you. Um, and at, at this point, I have to apologize because in order to define the cone K tilde for you, I first have to define another cone. This is this project is kind of like the, the study of various cones. Um, the extended Kähler cone. So the extended Kähler cone is the union of all Kähler, of Kähler cones of all Calabi-Yau's, which are birationally equivalent to your original Calabi-Yau X. Um, and by birationally equivalent, I just mean isomorphic, um, except for along curves. Um, and th that's a lot of words, but the picture that I want you to have in mind is simply that if, for example, you had three Calabi-Yau's, X, X prime and X double prime, which are all birationally equivalent, then the extended Kähler cone is simply the union of all three of their Kähler cones. Um, all right, so finally we're ready to define K tilde. So K tilde is the cone that you get um, by applying the so-called dual coordinate map to the extended Kähler cone K. Um, so what does this mean? It just means that we um, that we multiply the, the Kähler parameters or contract them using the uh, triple intersection numbers in each Kähler cone. So we just go Kähler cone by Kähler cone and multiply the Kähler parameters using um, the triple intersection numbers of that Calabia. And when we do this, we get a cone, which is K tilde. Um, that, that's, that's the cone that, that we need in order to verify the weak gravity conjecture. And so the upshot of this slide is that what we really need is to find the extended Kähler cone. Um, in a sense, once we have found the extended Kähler cone, getting K tilde is trivial because it just, it just involves applying this map where we find the, the dual coordinates. So what we really need is to find the extended Kähler cone. And um, now I'll, I'll show you how we can do that. All right, so now we come to um, calculating the extended Kähler cone using GV invariance. And that's really what I mean when I say reconstructing the Kähler moduli space. So the main point that I want to get across is that given only the Gopukumarvafa invariance of a Kalabiao X, we can reconstruct the extended Kähler cone. And I think this is really cool because what this means is that given the data for a single Kalabiao, we can obtain um, information about a whole class of Kalabiaos. 
Um, how does this work? Well, roughly the Gopu Kumar Vafa invariants tell us about which curves can be shrunk in the Kalabiao without inducing an infinite number of massless states. Um, so that's kind of a, a, a vague statement, but I'm now going to describe to you precisely how this works. And then after um, I'm done describing it abstractly, we'll apply this the machinery to our example from earlier. All right, so um, to obtain the extended Kähler cone, let's first of all compactify our five-dimensional theory on a circle to obtain a four-dimensional theory in type 2a string theory. So in this effective theory, the prepotential takes the following form. So again, there's this polynomial piece, which depends on the triple intersection numbers as well as the, the Kähler parameters. But now, of course, in type 2a, the prepotential receives instanton corrections. So we also have this infinite sum of um, non-perturbative corrections to, to the uh, prepotential. And I just want to, to walk you through um, what this sum means. So we're summing over all curve classes in the Mori cone of X or the BPS cone. And then we have here this N0 is the genus zero Gopu Kumar Vafa invariant of the curve class C. And then we have this function, which is a trilogarithm, whose argument is e to the 2 pi i times the curve class dotted with the Kähler parameters. So this exponent here is really just the volume of a particular curve. All right. Um, and now let's further suppose that there's a ray in the Mori cone, which has only a single curve class with a non-vanishing GV invariant. And I'll call this single curve class, this special curve class C0. So um, just to give you a more concrete picture, if you remember our example from earlier that, that I flashed up a few slides ago, um, we had this ray in the Mori cone, which had all zeros except for at the site zero comma one, which had a GV invariant of Six. So in this example, this, this curve class here, 0, 1, would be our special curve C0. Now let's change the Kähler parameter, which is given by the volume of that special curve C0, so that formally it becomes negative. So we'll take the volume of C0 and send it to minus the volume of C0. And by doing this, um, we're, you, the picture you should have in mind is that we're entering the Kähler cone of a new Calabi Yau X prime, which is birationally equivalent to X. Um, and this is up to one little subtlety, which I'll get back to in a couple of slides. But um, uh, for, for now, this is the picture that you should have in mind. All right, so now let's see exactly why that is. Um, on the next slide, I'm going to, to derive this fact to do a derivation. This is the only um, sort of like set of equations I'm gonna have in this slide, but um, I think it's really important to do and also very informative. So I wanna go through it carefully. All right, so again, let's start with the prepotential in type 2a. Um, this is exactly the same prepotential I wrote down a couple slides ago. We have the polynomial piece and this infinite sum of instanton corrections. The only thing I've done here is that I've separated out this one term, which is the term corresponding to our special curve C0. So that's all I've done here. I've just rewritten the, the prepotential. And now remember, I said we want to take the volume of the curve C0 to minus itself. So in other words, we want to take the curve class C0 dotted with the Kähler parameters to minus that. So that's all I'm going to do in this next line. I'm going to replace every time I see C0 dot T with minus C0 dot T. And when I do that, I get something like this. Um, and importantly, the only real change that happens here is that um, this term uh, gets an argument that, that flips sign. Um, and it's really important here that there was only that one curve um, that, that, that was special, or there was only that one ray that had only a finite number of states, um, <clears throat> because it means that we can make this substitution without doing any bad thing to the rest of this sum. So in other words, all of the volumes in the rest of this sum stay positive. So we're, we're making this one curve volume negative, but the rest stays positive. And uh, now uh, we can use this polylogarithm identity, which um, roughly speaking says that the trilogarithm of e to the minus something is the trilogarithm of e to the plus something plus a polynomial piece. And crucially, this polynomial piece has this cubic term. 
Um, and so what we're gonna do now is just substitute this expression into the above line here and see what we get. So when we do that, we end up with an expression that looks almost exactly like the first line that we started with, except for this one change, which is that the triple intersection numbers here have shifted. And they've shifted because of the inclusion of, um, uh, of this uh, cubic term in, in the trilogarithm identity. So what happened? Um, we took the volume of a curve to minus itself, and we ended up with the pre-potential for a new Calabi-Yau X prime. And this new Calabi-Yau has triple intersection numbers given by kappa prime ABC. Any questions about this? All right, so what have we learned? Let's recap. Um, we've learned that an isolated generator of the Mori cone with a finite number of non-vanishing GV invariants can be flopped to obtain a new calabi Um And now to, to return to this subtlety, which I promised you a few slides ago, um, if a divisor also shrinks when we shrink a curve, then we're sort of not allowed to go through that boundary, right? Because we've reached the boundary of the moduli space. Um, and the upshot is that by performing all of the available flops to uncover all the calabi which are birationally equivalent to the original calabi we can determine the extended Kahler cone. And so now let's apply this machinery in our concrete two-dimensional example from earlier. <clears throat> All right, so here's the example I showed you before. This is a calabi threefold X. Um, it has H11 equals to two. Um, and again, I'm just showing you the gopa kumar vafa invariance here in the Morricone. <clears throat> and um, for visual clarity, I'm going to put a dot everywhere I see a gopa kumar vafa invariant that's not zero. So that's all I'm doing here. I'm just putting black dots in the places where the GV invariants are not zero. And like I said before, um, there's this one special curve sitting at the site zero comma one, um, which can be flopped. So this curve, we're allowed to take um, the curve class C to minus C. All right, so now we're gonna do that. Um, so taking C to minus C gives rise to a new calabi X prime, which is birationally equivalent to X. And, um, when you take the volume of C to zero, uh, the point is that only a finite number of states becomes massless. And the number of states that becomes massless is equal to the gopa kumar vafa invariant of C. All right, so now let's really do this flop. So let's take this curve at zero comma one and send it to minus itself. And you can see that, that, that what happens when you do this is you end up with this pink cone here, which is the Mori cone of our new calabi X prime. All right, so we have the Mori cone of X in blue and the Mori cone of X prime in red or pink. And there's this overlapping region, which um, is another cone. And it's a really important cone. So I'm also going to give it a name. We call it the infinity cone. And we call it the infinity cone because um, every ray inside of this cone hosts an infinite number of BPS particles. So you can see why, why the infinity cone will be relevant for checking the weak gravity conjecture. All right, so here's um, just that picture again. I made it a little smaller. So we have the Mori cone of X in blue. We have the Mori cone of X prime in red, and we have this overlapping region, the infinity cone. And now I'm simply going to take the literal cone duals of all three of these cones. So for example, when I take the cone dual of the first quadrant, I get back the first quadrant and so on. So um, the dual of the Mori cone of X becomes on this side, the Kähler cone of X, the first quadrant, the Mori cone of X prime becomes the Kähler cone of X prime, this pink region on the right. And, um, as promised, the dual of the infinity cone in purple becomes the union of the two Kähler cones of X and X prime, i.e. the extended Kähler cone. So um, the upshot is that the infinity cone is the dual of the extended Kähler cone. All right. Um, so finally, we've obtained the extended Kähler cone and we're ready to check the weak gravity conjecture in this example. So again, here we have um, the extended Kähler cone of X and 
in order to obtain the cone K tilde, we have to apply this dual coordinate map. So remember that just means taking the Kähler parameters and contracting them with the triple intersection numbers inside each Kähler cone. And when we do that, we end up with this cone in yellow K tilde. And the important point is that K tilde is contained in the infinity cone. And so what this means is that every ray in K tilde has an infinite number of BPS states. And so the tower weak gravity conjecture is satisfied in this example. All right, so that was just one example, but you can see now that there's kind of an algorithm to check the tower weak gravity conjecture in any given Calabi-Yau. So what is this algorithm? First, we compute the gopa kumar vafa invariance. Then we determine the extended Kähler cone by performing all possible flops. Um, next, we apply the dual coordinate map to the extended Kähler cone in order to obtain this cone K tilde. And finally, we ask, is every site in K tilde populated by a non-vanishing gopa kumar vafa invariant? And if yes, then the tower weak gravity conjecture is satisfied. And we perform these steps in over a thousand Calabi Yaos in the Kreuzer Skarka database, so constructed as hypersurfaces in torque varieties. And we found that the tower weak gravity conjecture was always satisfied. All right, so that's kind of the, the, the punchline of this talk. Um, and now I'll, I'll give my conclusions. And um, I have two slides left. So I have the conclusions, and then I'll um, discuss uh, some food for thought, a, a, a few sort of mysteries or, or curious findings that, that we found um, that will hopefully foster some discussion. So to conclude, what did we do? We used the genus zero Gopu Kumar Vafa invariance in order to reconstruct the Kähler moduli space of Calabia threefolds. And with the full Kähler moduli space in hand, so the extended Kähler cone and the collection of BPS states, we verified the tower weak gravity conjecture in um, a large ensemble of examples. All right, so as promised, some, some food for thought. So some, some curious things. Um, first of all, all of the examples that we checked appeared to satisfy the weak gravity conjecture with genus zero Go Gopu Kumar Vafa invariance. And a question is why? You know, it could have been that we checked all these examples and we found that sometimes um, the genus zero GV invariance weren't enough and that you needed to calculate higher genus Gopu Kumar Vafa invariance in order to see that the weak gravity conjecture was satisfied. Um, Another thing that I completely swept under, under the rug this entire time is that all of the examples that we checked actually satisfied the stronger lattice weak gravity conjecture. So instead of just having an infinite tower um, everywhere you were supposed to, we actually found that every site was populated. Um, another thing is what about the infinite towers outside of K tilde? So, uh, you know, in order for the tower weak gravity conjecture to be satisfied, we, we needed to see that um, every ray inside of K tilde hosted an infinite tower of BPS states. But in general, we found that K tilde was uh, strictly contained in the infinity cone, so that there are rays inside of K tilde, all, all the rays inside K tilde have an infinite tower of states, but also there are rays outside of K tilde that have an infinite tower of states. And a question is why, you know, or, or do, do they do anything uh, important? For example, are there other kinds of black holes that need these infinite towers of states outside of K tilde in order to be able to decay? Something like that. I don't know. And finally, and this is just sort of um, a little advertisement, is that I didn't have, have time to tell you um, that now that we have this machinery to reconstruct the Kähler moduli space using Gopu Kumar Vafa invariance, there's a lot of really interesting features of the moduli space that we can uncover. Um, and th th there's going to be an example of this kind of uh, sort of more exotic behavior um, that's going to appear in work coming out hopefully this month with uh, Mankey Kim, Liam, Jakob, and Mike Stillman. All right, so with that, I will say thank you. Thank you so much for the great talk. Fantastic, before I give, uh, <coughs> give the mic to the other people who ask questions, I have an immediate question uh, myself, namely, um, 
this has maybe the smell of modular properties. Um, often th these kind of things are satisfied um, by transformation properties of modular forms. So in cases where a submodular space say, has a modular symmetry, like for elliptic, uh, also these kind of things, can you maybe make use of uh, you know properties of your Jacobi forms or these kind of things? Mm, so I, I, I'm not sure this will precisely answer your question, but I, I, I will say that this work I was teasing at the end there um, is precisely about using the reconstruction of the moduli space in this way to uncover some modular properties of super potentials in that case. So um, yeah, we're definitely finding that it, it works the other way around too, but that would be interesting to think about more. Okay, so sorry for sneaking in my own question. So next one is Kumrun. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Naomi. Very nice talk. So I just want to make sure I understand. You, uh, you phrased your discussion in the context of weak gravity conjecture, but couldn't you have said all of what you said without using weak gravity, namely, couldn't you have said this in the context of just checking the bekenstein hawking formula for the PPS black holes? Mm. Namely, the directions that you found, which were zero, if, if it weren't zero, then we disagree with the BPS predictions of the supergravity. So what you call the infinity cone was what the supergravity predicts to be the mass of black holes. And indeed, the full tower should be occupied at least when you get to sufficiently large charge. Again, that follows from the bekenstein hawking formula. So almost everything you said seems to be phrasable in the language of just the usual bekenstein hawking thing without using discussion about the weak gravity. Am I missing something? So let me see if I understand what you're saying. So um, it, it is the case that in the directions that only have a finite number of states, um, BPS black holes don't exist in those right. directions. And, and right. that's the point. Yeah, exactly. I'm just saying um, if and only if. In other words, the directions which do exist is predicted by Bekenstein Hawking, and the ones they don't shouldn't have existed. So you could have said it that way too. That's all. In other words, you could have said this is just a check on the Bekenstein Hawking formula. <laughs> For the BTS black holes. Well, do you need an infinite tower of states? In, yeah, in yeah. Because on Hawking predicts an infinite tower. Okay. Of course, right? There's okay. no, if you, the only, the only difficulty with the Vegas on Hawking would be that you are not sure whether the first few charged states are occupied or not, because you could be talking about small enough black holes, which are mm -hmm. close to being Planckian. But if you go sufficiently large, that's not a problem. So you do have a prediction that not only should be filled, it should be full lattice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is what you observe and that's that's a prediction yeah no that's a good point yeah and there, there's one minor point of course you could find examples where this genus zero would not suffice and in fact maybe none of the genus would suffice if you go for example to t6 so uh, all of them would vanish that's not an exciting example in that form but there are bps states but these none of them would capture it because they all vanish in that land it, it, totally. And yeah. And in fact, I, I glossed over one related subtlety um, when I was talking about the divisors shrinking is that there can be cases where you think that there's um, a, a curve that, that can be flopped. But in fact, there are BPS states all along that ray. It's just that the, the hyper multiplets and vector multiplets cancel out. And, right. Um, exactly. exactly. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Irene? Thank you for the talk, Naomi. Just very quick to make sure I understand or I remember all this comes. So the tower of states, the infinite towers that are not in the K tilde, mm -hmm. if you follow them through the modular space, you follow their mass, are towers that become massless at infinite distance or they seem to become massless at finite distance but are not weakly coupled? No, no, they don't become massless at, at finite distance. So at, at finite distance, for example, when you cross one of these walls, the only states that become massless are the ones associated to these curves along rays with only a finite number of states. So the, the conifold, yeah. Okay. okay, thanks. Are there any further questions or comments? Well, just after you stopped, there were several raised hands, more than two at least. No. <laughs> okay. So let's conclude the session for today. Thank you for thank uh, all the speakers.